afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Decca, and I am delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. We are thrilled to have a special guest with us today, Guy Gonzalez, who is the Chief Content Officer from Comics Plus. And he is going to guide us through available comics content for public and academic libraries. If you have any questions as we progress through this webinar, please use the chat feature and we will you can submit them and we will answer as we go along. So without further ado, Guy, I'll let you start. Take it away. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Gila Charles Gonzalez. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Library Pass, and we're here to talk about Comics Plus, our digital collection of comics, graphic novels, and manga available exclusively to schools and libraries. Uh, we don't have a consumer-facing version of this product, so everything we do is about bringing access to schools and libraries to this great library of content. And our underlying model is unlimited simultaneous access. So unlike some other uh, platforms you might be uh, more familiar with, there's no single user licenses involved. There's no wait list. There's no borrowing limits. And that really is kind of the secret sauce of what we offer. So uh, real quick, we're in over more than uh, 3,000 schools and libraries in the US, as well as several countries abroad. Uh, unlimited simultaneous access, no holes, no wait list, no limits. It allows libraries to comfortably promote and let this product circulate. It, uh, the content appeals to a broad range of readers because it's a deep, diverse collection. It's not limited to the handful of bestsellers that maybe you were able to squeeze into your digital budget. And we also provide a wealth of marketing materials, resources, and customer support to make, help you make sure you get the most out of the platform. The Comics Plus is only possible because we work with publishers who understand that libraries need fair licensing uh, agreements in order to really take full advantage of uh, digital content. So these publishers that we work with, if you're familiar with the comic space, we've got a variety of uh, what are known as direct market comics publishers, which are primarily uh, publishing for readers who shop at their local comic book markets. Uh, predominantly superheroes, but not limited to uh, superheroes at all. Dark Horse and Image are two of the biggest names in that category, but Boom Studios is also a big one, IDW, uh, Dynamite, Valiant Entertainment. You, uh, other, other than Marvel and DC, which do not participate in this licensing model, pretty much if you've got readers who are comic book store customers who are looking for similar content, that's your direct market category of publishers. On the manga side, uh, arguably the most popular category of comics, though not always represented as such in certain markets. Uh, we have a number of major publishers, Kodansha and Yen Press are our two biggest uh, traditional manga publishers. We also have Saturday AM, Toko Pop, Udon Entertainment, Digital Ma Manga, uh, Vast Visual, and Manga Classics is a publisher of literary adaptations uh, done in manga format. So if you've got manga, this is particularly useful for libraries who are serving younger readers or who are working with their local school systems. That's a really popular uh, category, collection of works that are all literate, classic literary adaptations. On the literary side, we've got everything from old school classics illustrated to uh, Fanagraphics, probably the best known independent literary uh, comics publisher out there. We've got a number of other uh, ones that fall into that category as well as Europe, Comics, Oni Press, NBM. Uh, we've got a deep collection of independent comics publishers. And by that, I'm talking about the anywhere from really small to mid-size you know, technically your dark horses, your image comics, those are all independent publishers as well. But we also work with a lot of really small publishers who basically don't have the distribution relationships with traditional library distributors to get their content into libraries in digital format and often not even in print format. So in some cases, a lot of these are de facto exclusives to us because we're the only distributor uh, willing and able to work with them. And there's a deep collection of independent publishers, everything from uh, an Andrews McMeal, which is a really large independent publisher, to really small publishers like Fanbase Press, Silver Sp Sprocket, A Wave Blue World. And then for any uh, libraries on the public side who have a strong uh, young 
community, young community of readers or who work closely with their schools in order to provide access to an expanded collection. We have a broad range of publishers who uh, focus on the K-12 market specifically or just young readers in general. And that's everything from your abdos, your capstones and your learners to uh, traditional children's publishers like Astro and Tune Books, Medium, Red Comet Press. All told, we have just about uh, just under 100 publishers that uh, we work with, all of whom make their content available on an unlimited simultaneous access model, which means your patrons have unlimited simultaneous access to the entire collection. Uh, I'm going to break it down a little bit for you real quick. Uh, any academic librarians in the audience, all of this applies to you. Uh, our full collection is what we make available to our academic libraries. On the public library side, you have a few options. So most libraries uh, who have Comics Plus have the full collection, and then they splinter it to make it available in age-appropriate collections, typically in a children's teen and then full collection structure. So I'm going to walk you through quickly how we kind of frame those. We have our own age-appropriate guidelines that we've developed. It's a six-tier system, everything from pre-K to um, adult. That is because about 65% of our audience base is actually school libraries, and obviously, I'd say even before the current wave of book bans and challenges, age appropriateness was always an important uh, consideration for schools. It's an even more important consideration nowadays. And our age appropriate guidelines, they're publicly available on our website. They make it crystal clear how we uh, determine what belongs in everything from our youngest, which is emergent, then children's, kids, teen, young adult, adult. Those are our six age uh, ratings. So in our children's public library collection, that includes what are our three youngest uh, age levels, emergent, children's, and kids. And that's roughly from pre-K up to about 10 years old. That includes everything from picture books and early, uh, early readers up to uh, relatively simple uh, comics. Uh, and then kind of just from a presentation perspective, the simplification of the layouts is what defines a kid's comic but from a teen content outside of the content, uh, the actual uh, content itself. So emergent children's kids, that is our children's library collection. It includes a range of popular characters and series, everything from Avatar, The Last Airbender and Minecraft are, were two of our biggest series over the past few years. Big Nate kind of became our biggest, uh, most popular series last year. That is a deep collection of both the traditional Big Nate comic series and the Nickelodeon version as well. Uh, there's a lot of Disney manga, predominantly from Tokyo Pop in this collection. And Sonic the Hedgehog is one of the other uh, major characters that kids are really familiar with. This is the content that circulates on its own. Kids go look for it, they find it, they devour it. On the manga side of things, if you're familiar with manga, um, manga, uh, Japanese cultural sensibilities are a little different from American cultural sensibilities, particularly when it comes to sexuality. So a lot of what would be considered for younger readers in Japan tends to get aged up in the U.S. because of some of those differences. But that said, we do have a lot of manga for young readers. We define manga uh, in a broader sense. So there's both the traditional manga content originally published in Japan in Japanese that has been licensed and translated uh, into English by American-based publishers. And then there's a broader category of kind of manga-inspired uh, content. Some of that is from publishers who, if they were in Japan, they would just be considered manga, uh, but they happen to not be Japanese publishers, but the aesthetics, the sensibilities, the storytelling approach, very manga-like. Uh, and a lot of kids, particularly at a younger level who don't have access to some of the um, older teen and young adult manga, appreciate this level. And that's everything from A Cheese uh, Sweet Home, Fox and Little Tanuki, to manga adjacent things like manga math mysteries is popular in schools because it takes manga and an important uh, school subject, puts them together into a package that's a little more appealing to kids who maybe don't want to read a math textbook. Uh, on the multicultural side, we have a broad, diverse collection across age ranges. 
Um, we work with a number of publishers who specialize in particular cultural sensibilities, as well as you know, being fortunate to work with a number of publishers who their own catalogs are relatively diverse. So if you've got diverse uh, populations that you serve, there's no shortage of content available here as well. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for our youngest readers, this is actually kind of new. We haven't even officially announced this yet. Uh, we have a small selection of picture books currently available. By the end of Q1, we will have several hundred, close to a thousand picture books. As we ramp that up into a specific category, we're going to be supporting on Comics Plus. So any of you public librarians who are serving young readers or parents of young readers, that picture book collection is going to be of particular interest as well. And if you've got questions, feel free to jump in at any point. Otherwise, I'm going to try and power through this and leave you guys time for a Q&A at the end. So at the teen level, uh, teen is our kids, teen, and young adult content. That's what we consider our teen public library. Again, libraries have the ability to, with the full collection, carve the age groups however they want. Your children's public library might just be emergent and children, and that includes teen. Your teen might just be teen and young adult. It's up to you how you want to break them down. For uh, clarity, we kind of present them this way. So kids, teen, young adult, the teen public library doesn't include our emergent and children's levels. We assume at the teen level, they're probably not that interested in that content. But again, with the full collection, you've got access to all of it. Same uh, structure here, a lot of the popular characters and series teen readers are familiar with here. With the addition of the teen and YA levels, you get uh, some better known uh, mature things like Stranger Things, Teenage Mutant, Ninja, Tur Min blah, blah, blah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles actually uh, umbrellas a couple of different age levels. The Nickelodeon-based series are for younger readers. The original and current ongoing series are more for teen and young adult readers. Um, so those two, th that collection bridges a couple of different age categories. Umbrella Academy is also in there, Lock and Key. Invincible is probably the biggest uh, superhero, not Marvel or DC, that's in the collection. And that's from Image. Here we, uh, at the teen level with teen and young adult, the availability of manga greatly expands, particularly at the young adult level. This is where Kadansha and Yen in particular come in really strong. Udon has a couple of notable uh, franchises, uh, per the Persona series and Street Fighter. If you've got any gamers in your uh, community, they're probably well aware of those two franchises in particular. Manga at this age level also gets a lot more um, expansive. So if you think, if your perception of comics is limited to for kids and or superheroes, manga is basically take every publishing category in traditional publishing, there's a manga version of it. So manga is not just, you know, Naruto and Pokemon that you might be familiar from TV shows, the uh, manga genre, adults read manga in Japan. It's a very popular category for older readers. So the diversity in genre and categories is the same as if you were looking at your traditional uh, library shelves for fiction and nonfiction. Manga encompasses everything from romance and school life and family dramas to the superhero sci-fi fantasy. And there's also a lot of strong nonfiction in the manga category as well. Graphic nonfiction at this age level becomes a really strong uh, category as well. Everything from uh, younger school appropriate nonfiction. And when I say school appropriate, I mean curriculum, explicitly curriculum adjacent to uh, a broad range of memoirs and biographies that are going to be appealing to readers on their own, but also could be aligned to curriculum objectives. So again, any public libraries who are serving their local school population, this is a category that would be of particular interest. And on the academic side, this is the category we tend to get asked a lot about because it's the one that tends to blend most into uh, curriculum needs. And here at this level, we just spotlight some of the publishers, but I took you through those already. So then you get into the full collection. Again, the full collection includes everything I just talked about, and then it's our adult tier. 
Our adult tier of titles are only available to public libraries and academic libraries. These titles are intended for readers 18 and up. It is the traditional publishing definition of adult. It is not adult as in these are X-rated comics. Um, school libraries don't get access to these titles because they're 18 plus. So public and academic libraries, this is about a third of the overall collection and it includes a broad diverse range of titles that particularly your, uh, a lot of your literary award winners tend to fall at the adult age level. And here's where some of our um, bigger direct market publishers have their strongest uh, catalog because as much as comics publishers like to claim, hey, our comics are all ages, a lot of comics that are not being produced by publishers who specifically uh, target kids tend to be older teens, young adult to adult. And we've got a lot of great content here. And what this slide, and you guys will have access to a copy of this uh, slide afterwards. Um, this slide also includes titles for adult readers, includes a lot of strong YA as well in these recommendations. And here you've got a mix of fiction, nonfiction, and manga. If there's a category of interest your readers have, if you we don't have the book they're looking for specifically, we absolutely have five to 10 easy read alikes for pretty much anything you could think of, including your Marvel and DC superheroes. We have some libraries where that's a priority for them. We have a deep selection of superhero comics. If they only wanna read Spider-Man, well, then there's not much we can do for them. But if they are into the superhero uh, sensibilities, there's a deep uh, collection here from Image, Dark Horse, IDW, as well as a couple of other uh, smaller publishers. Uh, the collection is predominantly English language. We do have a small but growing collection of Spanish language content. Um, this slide is specifically targeting our uh, school library structure. But again, for any of your younger readers or readers who are looking for a, a larger collection than their school can offer, we do have a few hundred uh, Spanish language titles across a variety of categories. Some are explicitly educational, some are not, and they just happen to be in Spanish. Uh, Quince is our most popular one. That is the bilingual edition of a book that was originally published in English, then they published a bilingual edition. That has been in our top 25 every year since we launched. And it's from a tiny publisher called Fanbase Press that I guarantee you less than five of you on this call probably have this in your collection, physical or digital. I'm willing to, not knowing who's on this call, make that bet because that's the depth our catalog brings. And if your uh, collection development decisions are partly being made on the basis of single user licenses, a lot of this is content you might not have in your collection because you're spending a lot of money on pick your favorite bestseller that's costing you more money than you like. Uh, also in here, and again, I'm not going to go through this, is for your reference, we've, this was our uh, top, 20, uh, top 10 titles in 2023. Because uh, our school library uh, uh, customer mix is so heavy, our top 10 is always dominated by uh, kids and teen titles. It's kind of like Netflix before they had profiles and your kids dominated your recommendations. But we have broken out our top 10 by each age level. So you can get a good sense of the range of content that's available in the collection and get a sense of if it's appropriate for your community or not. And I'll stop sharing there. Great, thank you so much. We really appreciate having you here. And I thought we'd take a little deeper dive now into some Q&A with a panel of some of the folks that we have on board. Um, the first one would be Sarah Shepard. Sarah, uh, sorry, Sarah. Sarah is a librarian and a Western, our Western sales manager for the children and teens department. And Lynn and Car, I'm sorry, Lynn Carley and Kathy Clevenger, um, who are both managers from our academic team. So I'll start first with Sarah. As Sarah, as someone who's previously worked in the children and teens department in a public library setting, what insights do you have regarding programming with comics and Comics Plus? And could it be used for a person in pro for in-person programming in a library? What are your thoughts about that? 
Um, so just to answer the last part first, absolutely, it could be used for in-person programming. Um, if you are a library and you want to do a book club for kids, that's a comics book club or for teens even, or adults, I guess. Uh, but kids and teens is really my wheelhouse. Um, comics Plus is a great option for that just because of their lending model. Um, since it's multiple users, simultaneous use, no holds, no waiting, you can pick a title that's available there. And that would be a fantastic book club selection because you know all your readers are going to be able to get it. Um, you know, they can look at it on their computer. They can look at it on a device like a tablet or a phone. Um, so it's just, it's nice and easy. Um, you know, you're not going to have to buy a whole bunch of additional copies of a physical book to do a book club. Um, so that's a really wonderful thing. Um, I also really like that they do have some resources available in the Comics Plus platform um, to help you with some programming. So if you're like, I have no idea about comics, like I, that's not my thing at all. Um, they do have some help in there for you. Um, some ideas on some like in-person programming you could do. If you wanted to just take it a little broader from a book club perspective, you can do like creating your own just like little comic strips and they have a little uh, template in there that you can use, which is really great. Um, so it's great for programming. You know, you can do even just a virtual one where people can, you know, do a Zoom meeting if you want to still keep it in that sphere. You could do that, but you can bring it to the in person as well. Yes, lots of great resources, definitely in the Comics Plus platform. Uh, a lot of fun ideas too. How do you think Comics Plus can encourage literacy and reading for some of the youngest patrons at the library? So we know that little our kids always kind of want to copy the big kids. <laughs> you know, they're talking about school. Um, and, you know, so kids kids want to read graphic novels and comics, no matter how old they are. Um, and we're seeing a lot more being published in the kind of the early reader sphere. Um, just this morning, we had the Youth Media Awards. And one of the titles that won the Geisel, uh, Geisel Honor is Worm and Caterpillar Are Friends, uh, which is an early graphic novel book. So you know, there's kind of getting more, I don't know if you want to call it legitimacy, um, given to graphic novels and comics as, you know, useful for beginning readers. Um, also, we know that kids can learn, you know, harder words kind of faster because they're being depicted in the pictures since there's kind of more pictures per amount of words, I guess, you know, if you're looking at a, a typical picture book, you know, you have maybe a big chunk of text and one picture. Um, but in a graphic novel, you know, you may have several panels and each of those have just a little bit of text. So kids can kind of infer what's going on in the, from what's going on in the picture. They can help help them figure out what those words are. Um, I have personally a five-year-old daughter and she loves the Comics Plus. Um, so we do look at those emergent reader books um, and she really does enjoy them. So um, we have a lot of fun with it. And, you know, it's, it's something that's nice to be able to get a book with like no hold, no waiting. I can just go in there and find something for her to enjoy. We can read it together. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for your perspective, Sarah. We appreciate that uh, on the public library side. And I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about the academic side now. Um, Lynn and Kathy, what are some of your thoughts on incorporating Comics Plus into academic libraries? Are there, and are there any specific considerations or benefits that you'd like to highlight with that? Thank I'm you, going to share my screen too. I'm sorry, so I can give you no some worries. information. No worries. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Um, obviously, for academic libraries, let's turn our lens just for a few minutes here, shift over to the academic space. Um, obviously, Comics Plus is a captivating platform, and the whole format of comics, graphic novels, and manga, as you just learned, is um, a way to to actually present really important concepts and enhance student engagement in the college and university environment. I know that many of you on this call today are aware of the proliferation of comic studies, comic arts, and other majors and minors that are similar to that uh, nationwide. Really, there's much more coursework around this uh, format, this medium. And many of you as librarians supporting academics are probably wondering how to support those programs and that kind of coursework. So this is a really nice option. Another thing that's really cool about comics as a format is that they very much democratized the classroom. They leveled the playing field, particularly in the academic space. Uh, students can see themselves in 
these, uh, these, these interesting diverse titles. And it actually has been proven to increase comprehension. Believe it or not, as Sarah just mentioned, there's obviously more visuals. They're visually stunning, they're captivating. There's, there's, there's less or there are fewer words in graphic novels. But because of the different learning modalities that we see in the academic environment, we have auditory learners, we have experiential learners, we have visual learners particularly for the visual learners or those with um, lower uh, English skills, let's say non-native English speakers, particularly if they're native Spanish speakers, this content can be very, very accessible. And it can also help to reinforce uh, very complex concepts like societal issues, social issues, and it can aid in understanding uh, complex literary terms and concepts. And it really is helpful for students to learn this way. That's, that's as uh, Sarah said, sort of legitimizing the role of comics, manga, and graphic novels in the academic environment. Another thing that's really exciting for students is that, and for instructors, as well as you, the librarians supporting them, uh, you can explore a variety of genres using comics and graphic novels. Now, we all have our particular genres that we all uh, seek out in terms of leisure reading, and students are the same, uh, but comics as a format are very accessible, and they're seen as fun. So why not learn a little bit while you're having fun? It also tends to heighten the imagination of students and uh, very much a visual storytelling. Uh, beyond the obvious, uh, it's just very fun to read comics and graphic novels. So they can help uh, reluctant readers, they can help non-native speakers, as I mentioned, and accessibility is key. There are myriad benefits of utilizing this medium in the classroom and in academic libraries. So we're so excited to see you all here today and let us know how we can help you. Lynn, um, one other question. Are there any tools or features that support academic research and coursework that you want to highlight? Um, Guy, I will turn that question over to you, the expert. Sorry, there, say that one more time. Are there, specific academic, are there specific academic features of the platform that might be of interest? So we are a reading platform. We prioritize uh, independent reading and discovery. The academic library customers we have uh, basically look at us from two lenses. One is that strictly they want to offer students access to as much content as they want, regardless of curriculum relevance. I think you guys have a term for it, whole student approach or something like that. I forget what the academic library term is for it. Those are the, what was that? Holistic. Holistic. Perhaps. So that is the, I'd say that's the approach most of our current academic library customers take. And then the others tend to take, um, they identify specific titles that align to uh, their curriculum, particularly when they're in specific disciplines that we're strong in. So like I mentioned, graphic nonfiction and biography. Those are, that's a category we're really strong in. We have a number of art of books. So art, uh, we've got a couple of art colleges that that was the primary draw for the collection. So it's kind of as flexible as it can be. The, the one place I'll tell you, if you're just looking for the time top 100 graphic novels, we're, we're not your product. The, we are about, hey, you, you want uh, students to have deeper access beyond that top 10 list that everybody talks about and to be able to do their own discovery and research. And you value diversity because let's be honest, most of your curriculums syllabus are not the most diverse when it comes to comic selections. If I could also just add that in the conversations I've had with academics, one thing they've really uh, focused on is the ability to link directly to titles through Canva or some other tool like that. Um, so that if, if a graphic design department wants everyone, all the students to focus on one title, uh, they can link to it easily and everyone can get to it because it's not the one book, one checkout model, because everyone has instantaneous uh, access to the title. Exactly. Thank you, Eric. And another great point, thanks for bringing that up, is that a lot of you are considering uh, offering the one book, one college or the one book, one university model, sort of a, a university-wide or a college-wide book club. This can be fabulous for that. 
and allow many more students to participate. And we have found that the use of comics and manga graphic novels in the classroom does assist with student engagement. So if your student engagement goals um, include uh, ramping up usage, this is a great option for you. Right. And I see a question from Emily. I'll just answer that because that's a question a lot of people have rather than just typing in the chat. So yes, the like I mentioned, the public libraries, most of our customers have the full collection. And then depending on their authentication method, there's a couple of different ways to make slices of that collection available to specific um, patrons. So a lot of libraries will use, there's a, they have a children's library card, that child can register for their account and they would only be able to access the, whatever you've deemed to be the children's library collection. Same for teen. Now, if they have their parents' adult library card, then they could have access to that. Um, but we have a number of different authentication options and we've not run into a library yet who we couldn't support that ability to uh, filter content uh, based on who the user is, not based on their logging in and only seeing certain content in the full collection. They would have access to the collection you deemed appropriate for them. Thank you. And once again, academics will have access to the entire collection, which is great because many of those young adult uh, titles that are considered teen are perfect for uh, young college students. Also, there was a question in the chat that we might wanna address verbally uh, regarding access. Uh, the app is accessible on any app, uh, on any uh, device that takes an app. So any tablet, uh, any uh, iOS and Android specific. Yeah, iOS and Android, we don't have, occasionally there's some people out there who use Kindle Fires. We don't have a Kindle specific app um, and honestly, won't. Thank you. Well, great. Great That's insights great. from all of you. Um, Lynn, Eric, Guy, Sarah, any closing thoughts or additional information that you'd want to share with the audience? Great. I, oh, one more. Eric? I, I would just say, you know, we, we just scratched the surface here and we're going to be following up with you and you know, to, to get more into it, please follow up with us and, and talk to your sales consultant and we'll be able to go into more depth at that point. You know, this is just the, the surface of the topic. And for the academic team, I'll just mention that the academic email address is in the chat. It's academic at baker-taylor.com. And just speaking for our team, Lori, Kathy, Jeremy, Victor, and I would be thrilled to discuss this with you, how Comics Plus can help you to meet your student engagement goals. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, well, great. Katie. Well, if there's not anything else, that concludes our webinar on Comics Plus today. Um, a biggie thank you to Guy um, for the enlightening presentation and to all the panelists um, for all of your valuable insights. If there are any further questions um, by anybody attending or you want more information, please don't hesitate to reach out. We appreciate you all joining us today. We wish you a great week and thank you so much. Have a good one.